morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, where, wherever you are in the world for Daryl, it's very early morning and uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, I'm Nicolas Veron at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce this new session of the financial statement series. And today we'll talk about central clearing, a very um, critical, often misunderstood function uh, in financial markets and um, one of the world's leading uh, experts, if not the leading expert in that, is Daryl Duffy. He got his uh, bachelor's degree in civil engineering, actually, in 1975 in the, at the University of New Brunswick, which, of course, is in Canada, not in New Jersey. Uh, then a master's of economics at the University of New England, which is in Australia, not in Massachusetts. Uh, and his PhD in engineering economics, uh, reconciling the former two uh, at Stanford in 1984. And since then, he's been on the finance faculty at Stanford, but also visiting uh, uh, a faculty in many places at the uh, University of California at Berkeley, University of Paris Dauphine, University of Lausanne, and also EPFL at Lausanne. And importantly, at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where he was on a sabbatical uh, last year until April this year. Uh, very connected, I guess, with uh, the topic today. And Darrell also served uh, in the Financial Advisory Roundtable of the New York Fed for a decade uh, up to 2016. I should mention he's also been on a number of corporate boards, including uh, at Moody's, uh, Longtime supporter of the Peterson Institute for a decade until 2018. Um, he's um, also been at iShares at the time of its acquisition by BlackRock uh, more than a decade ago. Uh, and he's on the board of Dimensional Fund Advisors, an uh, investment firm uh, co founded by Eugene Fama, I think, in Texas. He's also a prolific consultant for a variety of organizations, including in the private sector, but also the International Monetary Fund and others on a number of uh, technical and not so technical issues. Uh, Theo Floor uh, got his uh, bachelor's degree in mathematics and computer science at Imperial College London in 2008. He then got the master's in mathematics at the University of Bath. He's been uh, for a long time at the Deutsche Börse Group um, between 2008 and 2020, uh, specifically at Eurex Clearing, which one, is one of the world's important uh, clearing houses, or as they're also called CCPs, Central Counterparties. And I'm mentioning that acronym because in 2020, uh, Theo became the uh, chief executive officer of CCP Global, which at the time I think was called CCP12. Uh, the Global Association of Central Counterparties um, that was initially based in Shanghai and now in uh, Amsterdam. So with that, Daryl, over to you. Thanks, Nicola. Uh, what a pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks for setting this up. And it's a pleasure to also uh, have Teo on. Uh, Teo is one of the leading experts in central clearing, which is our topic for today. Well, I'd like to just spend a few minutes uh, quickly going over the idea of central clearing and why it's valuable. And then another couple of minutes talking about a recent proposal by the Securities and Exchange Commission of the United States to centrally clear the entire US treasury market. Uh, that in my view is an excellent proposal and uh, the costs and benefits have been raised uh, very controversially among market participants in the US. Uh, and I'll try to explain briefly why I think uh, the benefits easily exceed the costs. But that's not a, an easy proposition, and there are a lot of devils in the details, uh, which we probably won't get into today, unless there's uh, issues coming in from your participating audience uh, to, to address. So let me uh, quickly show a few slides. Uh, I'll use the uh, screen share to do that. Now I'll go to full screen. Should be, there we go. It works. Whoops. Okay, so this is a diagram of how the US treasury market, since it's my main focus recently, uh, is centrally cleared. And the green dots in this diagram are the uh, dealers that intermediate the US treasury market. There is no exchange for US treasuries. It's intermediated by dealers. So dealer one, for example, might be JP Morgan, dealer two might be Goldman Sachs and so on. 
The blue dots are the customers of the dealers. These are typically large institutional investors, asset management firms like BlackRock, mutual funds, uh, pension funds, foreign, foreign uh, exchange reserve managers of central banks, and so on. In the center of the diagram is the central counterparty, or CCP, which uh, for this market is called the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation. Uh, and basically, the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation uh, takes on the role of guaranteeing trades between the dealers. So if Goldman Sachs D1 and JP Morgan D2 were to uh, make a trade in US Treasuries, instead of being obligated to each other to settle that trade, the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation would step in between them and guarantee uh, that the trade would actually settle. And that lowers risk in this market. It was introduced in the 1980s when there was some frailty among certain dealers in the government securities market. And now it's uh, the norm. In fact, it's the rule in the United States that dealers must centrally clear their trades. However, nobody else in practice does that. And these blue dots are their trades are not centrally clear. That's a source of risk in the market, especially for certain market participants like high frequency trading firms. Moreover, there's a lot of lost efficiencies because let's say dealer one has a position with customer one of a hundred million of some note uh, and customer one is buying and customer two is selling for let's say 120 million of the same note. That means dealer one is obligated for 220, the absolute sum of those two numbers of settlement risk. And dealer one is got a lot of commitments on its balance sheet to settle those securities. If customers one and two were members of the fixed income clearing corporation, or at least had their trades centrally cleared there, then dealer one would not be obligated for more than the net difference, which would be 20 million, that is 120 minus 100. And that reduction through netting would not only make the market safer, it would also make it much more efficient because it lowers the uh, commitments of the dealers and reduces their capital requirements and improves their safety. Um, the proposal to, by the Securities and Exchange Commission would take us to this diagram where everybody is having their trade centrally cleared or every large investor. And that uh, would increase the safety and soundness of the system quite dramatically. It would also pave the way for all to all trade because then exchange operators could enter the market and allow customers to trade directly on a central trading platform and all to all market. That wouldn't take over the market. It would still uh, be uh, one part of trading. There would still be a lot of dealer intermediated trading, but it would open up more opportunities to trade treasuries that don't impinge on a dealer's balance sheet and therefore make the market more efficient. There's been a lot of pushback by the blue dots. <laughs> They're saying basically, this is costly. Why should we do this? And it's uh, yes, indeed, it would raise costs probably a little bit for the customers of dealers because now they would have to post margin. Uh, but, you know, why, uh, why would uh, anyone want to guarantee that others are safe from themselves uh, as a public good? That's, you know, that's what economists call a positive externality. And usually you have to introduce something like a rule in order to get people to make the entire market safer when there are costs for individual participants. It's the same reason that we have pollution regulations. No one would, no emitter of uh, carbon would want to uh, stop emitting on its own. It would have to be required to stop emitting. And this is an analogous public good. Just to give you an idea of the efficiency gain, I'm almost finished, Nicola. Uh, there are two economists at the New York Fed, Michael Fleming and Frank Keane, <clears throat> that uh, calculated the total settlements of US Treasury securities in the first part of 2020. And on peak days in that, in March and April of 2020, when the COVID crisis had just been declared, daily settlements approached or went over $1 trillion in this market. The US Treasury market is huge. If that market had been centrally cleared as a counterfactual, you can see in the bottom curve that the total amount of settlements because of this effect of netting purchases 
Again, sales would have been reduced by about 70%. This is a dramatic reduction in the risks faced by the dealers and also in the costs um, uh, in terms of uh, their capital requirements and other requirements for managing such large settlements. So this would introduce a huge efficiency. Central clearing was brought into the derivatives markets after the, uh, the global financial crisis of 2008 and 9 to again, great, uh, great pushback from market participants saying this would be the end of the swaps market, uh, liquidity would disappear, costs of trading would go way up and, and uh, doom and gloom. Uh, whereas in fact, uh, after central clearing was brought into the swap market, uh, liquidity has not disappeared. Volumes are every bit as high or higher than before. And the bid offer spread for trading interest rate swaps is now roughly one tenth of it was before the advent of central clearing in this market. So uh, my, my guess is similar things would happen in the treasury market. The efficiency gains would be quite significant. It is true there'd be some costs, but the market would be much safer because when uh, some major market participant fails, the central counterparty is there to make sure that it doesn't unravel into a systemic crisis. Now, uh, I could say a whole lot more, but I want to hear from Teo, and I'm pretty sure that I've used that. There's still enough time to say more, so so, so please uh, feel free to add a bit uh, for the scene setting. Okay, so uh, one of the, I'm going to go back to this diagram as far as scene setting. One of the key details to be ironed out in the U.S. Treasury market is how exactly these blue dots trades would be brought into the central counterparty. And that ha that is one of the big puzzles here because the Securities and Exchange Commission proposal does not clarify exactly how those uh, customer trades would be centrally cleared. Probably they would not become clearing members or most of the uh, large uh, investors would not become clearing members. They would arrange for their dealer to clear the trade for them. That's called sponsored clearing. And... Uh, there's a lot of discussion about how exactly that would be done and whether the customers would be required to post margin or not. In the US Treasury financing market, which is part of this proposal, bilateral repos of US Treasuries are currently not only not cleared, they're not margined by and large, only about 30% of those bilateral repos, and that's a $4 trillion a day market. It's a huge market. Only about 30% are margined, meaning there's some uh, money backing up the settlement uh, risk on these trades. 70% are not margined, according to the Office of Financial Research. And uh, that, that would mean that margin requirements are insufficient in the repo market. But it's also not clear how the SEC proposal will cure that problem because it doesn't seem to require margin it, uh, uh, for those positions, a dealer could put up the margin on behalf of the of the customers rather than the customers being required to do that. Leverage in this market is very large. The norm in the multi-trillion dollar repo market is uh, zero margin. So that's um, very, very, uh, in my view, unsatisfactory uh, approach to uh, uh, managing settlement risk in the most important securities market in the entire world, the US Treasury market. Why would, it, why would we not want to make this market um, safe and sound like all pretty much all exchange traded markets? Equities markets are centrally cleared. Tao can say more about that. Derivatives markets are centrally cleared. Futures markets, options markets, Many most derivatives markets that are standardized or centrally cleared, and yet we have this $25 trillion outstanding treasuries market, the world's most important market, uh, which is not centrally cleared. So I, I definitely support the uh, SEC proposal to do this. Central clearing is an obvious improvement in the safety and soundness and efficiency of this market. That's a call to action. Uh, just for clarification for many people in the audience who are not as familiar as you are with uh, those markets, when you say margin, is that entirely synonymous with collateral or is there a, a, a marginal difference? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it basically means the positions are collateralized. It can be done in a number of ways by posting cash against the commitment to settle or by over collateralizing uh, the positions with the central counterparty. The central counterparty in the case of the US Treasury market has a very un unusual way of handling default management. It actually uses customer margins to guarantee the positions. So the, the default guarantee fund, which is used to cover the defaults of uh, clearing members is made up of margins supplied by the clearing members on each trade. That's among uh, central clearing around the world, as Teo can say, that's very unusual. Normally, uh, clearing members will not allow their margins to be used to cover uh, default risk, but the FICC does that. And Teo and I actually spoke at a previous meeting about some of the efficiency gains associated with letting uh, the central counterparty use margins uh, to manage uh, default risk as well as uh, uh, reducing the uh, exposure of a given clearing member. Thank you. Um, and I should say at this point, because FICC is prominent on your slide, um, uh, as I often do, I should disclose that I'm on the board of the trade repository arm of DTCC, and DTCC also owns and operates FICC, but I have nothing to do with FICC, so I'm not conflicted in mm. that um, conversation. Theo, over to you. Nicola, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Peterson Institute uh, for the invitation to speak. And Daryl, uh, pleasure to see you again. And it's always wonderful going after you because now I've just decided to redo the way I'm doing my introduction uh, because you always gave, always give such a different but nice concise uh, overview of central clearing. I can't resist but make one comment just, just for the margins and the specificity that uh, Daryl was mentioning. Uh, in, in central clearing, essentially, you have a trustless system. The, the central counterparty, this hub at the, the center FICC in this case, assumes that everyone can default tomorrow and it charges them accordingly. And the margin is typically held against your own default. So you kind of have to pay up for the, the poker chips before you come to the table. And uh, that's common across all CCPs, but uh, the specific point is whether your margins can be used for the default of others. Um, there is always a collectivization, a socialization, a mutualization of risk. Uh, if things are extremely severe, the market sort of pulls together and spreads the losses against themselves. In this particular case, of which I know of only one other similar, smaller CCP in the world, um, it is uh, that's a stage which enters in much earlier. But um, I think the, the question uh, we were asked to, to prepare for was, uh, when should you clear? And Looking at the history, I mean, Daryl mentioned the two august and very interesting salient cases of the last uh, decade and currently uh, OTC interest rate derivatives and OTC credit derivatives, as well as now treasuries, both in the cash trade and repo trade in, in the US. But historically, uh, there have been very few mandates to clear. Um, this pollution uh, charging principle on carbon emissions was something that was typically undertaken by markets because the markets where central clearing was undertaken, um, they saw the advantages either of the operational procedures or of the risk management procedures taken by CCP, and they were more comfortable or more efficient in trading in markets where that was being done by what used to be called typically a clearinghouse, as Nicola mentioned, nowadays often called a central counterparty in its uh, full glory. The way to think about this is that if you have trades which have a very short maturity, where the trade is concluded and settled, for instance, in one day for a cash equity trade in some jurisdictions like India, the interest in central clearing is from the operational efficiency. There are lots of trades. You want everything to settle quickly and promptly. So you want rigor in the settlement procedure and a neutral third counterpart that takes care of this for the market participants is very effective. On the other hand, if the trade has a long time until its ultimate settlement, the term of it, for instance, a 30 year interest rate uh, swap contract between two counterparts, let's say a pension fund and a dealer, the advantage of having a central counterparty comes out of the risk management. This margining practice, the fact that you can trust that even if one of the counterparts defaults during those 30 years, the trade will be replaced by the CCP's default management procedures. So depending on which one of, for instance, our 42 members you speak to, uh, they either weight the operational efficiencies greater 
or the risk management efficiency is greater. In the last decade after the financial crisis where interest rate swaps were compelled to be cleared in part in many jurisdictions, I say in part, it's not as comprehensive as it could be in my view, there was a natural focus on the advantages of this risk management because you were uh, essentially compelling everyone to settle their trades that they've agreed to with rigor, which gave confidence to other counterparts, but it of course also uh, created the cost of having to post margin for trades that you've undertaken, which was considered naturally to, to be a sort of very sensible uh, practice after, uh, after the great financial crisis. For reasons not to clear, um, I would sort of lump them into three broad categories. One is that you have too small a market, um, it's too bespoke, too odd. Uh, me and Nicolas have done a very bizarre trade together. It's a very bilateral bet. It includes his beautiful bookshelf and it relates to specifically some esoteric event. Uh, if you clear this trade centrally, you can do it, but it will be prohibitively expensive because uh, in the CCP's role, if one of us was to default and be unable to fulfill our contractual obligations, the CCP, in this case, Daryl, let's say, would have to undertake those obligations and find a replacement for the duration of the contract. So in very specific niche markets, uh, clearing might be uh, needlessly expensive, not worthwhile. Uh, One-off trade relating to a specific IMF-funded bid a bridge building project in some country uh, might not qualify easily for that. Another reason not to clear is that it might be very lucrative to maintain the credit relation. Um, typically, one of the unsung advantages of central clearing relates to its enabling all to all trading. If you have a clear trade, um, if I had traded with Nicola um, and I wanted to exit the trade and I picked somebody at random from the audience um, to be my counterpart, I would not be able to net those trades out legally and economically unless they were going through a central counterparty with ease. Nicola might agree to it, but at a cost. If we, so the way you should imagine those beautiful graphics that uh, Daryl shared is that once you're in a cleared environment, any of those counterparts that are connected to the CCP can trade against any other counterpart for new trades or to adjust or cancel existing trades. That's an extremely efficient part of central clearing, but it does make some markets brutally competitive. And there are economic reasons why you might value maintaining the trading and credit relation on a bilateral basis. These are my customers, these are my trades. I do not want them to trade out of them with somebody else. The last reason uh, is politics. Um, there might be circumstances where for policy reasons, for instance, central banks might not wish that their currencies are cleared. Uh, a good example of this is that you have an enormous, very standardized market in FX globally, but if you were to place these into central counterparties, then this, of course, would bring them into the fold of general monetary policy and FX transactions. So there might be reasons that central banks and policymakers and, of course, private sector actors uh, opt not to do that. Sorry, uh, just, uh, just on this still, sorry to interrupt, uh, FX, of course, is for foreign exchange markets. Um, does that mean that central banks would have less control, typically in uh, jurisdictions where there's not full freedom of capital flows um, over transactions? Or can you go a little bit more into the mechanism and the reasoning here? And, and you mentioned politics, but do you mean really policy here or actual politics? Um, I mean both. I mean it very loosely and broadly. Um, politics also might relate to the role that uh, certain FX dealers have sort of indirectly on behalf of specific central banks. Um, so not, not, uh, not, not, you know, the Hill kind of politics, but, uh, but, but uh, other, other ones. For, if you have a controlled currency, um, the only way that you could really offer it to central clearing is basically to break that control, right? Because you would have to enable the CCP to settle those trades in that currency, especially if the CCP is offshore to your jurisdiction, then that would have to come with a liberalization of those controls, at least for, for that portion of it. Um, you would, of course, have to give up some control in that in that case. Absolutely. The, the other question is, <clears throat> you know, if you imagine that you have multiple FX centers that trade in the sort of free currencies, uh, these are all settled very elegantly through CLS, of course. Um, if you were to introduce CCPs, then you would have to have some C kind of... Is, uh, oh, is, excuse uh, me, sorry. So CLS Bank, which is uh, uh, operated globally, and we had a session on financial statements on that very important infrastructure. Um, sorry to interrupt. Oh, excuse me. So it stands for continuous link settlement, which is a sort of odd term, but it, it is essentially uh, the primary 
location for settlement that uh, FX, the real wholesale FX markets would operate through. And it's very carefully designed to be supervised by the, the key central banks. Um, but in, in, in introducing clearing, if you would like it to operate with the great certainty that, for instance, CLS type arrangements provide, you would have to make careful policy decisions on which CCPs with which customers would be included in which styles of settlement. Uh, there have been attempts to do this that have typically happened outside of the primary cycle. Um, but this, of course, would also change the, uh, let me say, the availability of uh, participation directly into the FX markets to all of the CCPs counterparts. This this all to all trading, uh, there might be policy reasons why uh, that is not preferred. I think I've overrun my time. I'm sorry. I tried to be very brief. I hope I haven't. Uh... No, this is this is great. And as usual with these issues of market structure, uh, things that are obvious to market participants who are in the market are almost completely impenetrable uh, to uh, observers who are outside of the market and uh, don't do it for a living. So uh, thanks for shedding light on it. Um, maybe I will start from the US Treasury market, so the focus uh, of uh, Darren's presentation, and then we'll go uh, to uh, broader considerations on uh, market clearing in, uh, in other market segments and, uh, and, and more at the level of principle. But, um, but starting with the US Treasury market, um, I have two questions, Darrell, uh, on the proposal, which is both the proposal from the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which you've uh, referred to, and maybe you can update us on uh, at what stage that proposal is, what are the prospects for adoption, um, and uh, and also uh, the way you would uh, advise to do it, uh, irrespective of what the SEC says. So my two questions is um, are about the objections from the industry and the kind of the political economy of it. So first is about dealers. You mentioned that the uh, blue uh, dots in your chart, uh, customers who are not dealers um, don't like the idea of having to post uh, margin, but what about the dealers? What are their positions in the debate? Uh, and the second one uh, is one you gave us a hook for. Uh, you said there are issues of devil in the details uh, that uh, might uh, uh, you know, be uh, objections to the proposal. So what are the main uh, devilish, uh, detailish uh, issues in uh, that debate? Thank you. Sure. Uh, those are the two best questions, Nicolas. You're, you, as usual, you're you're right on the mark. Uh, so uh, just the status of the proposal. Last year, the Securities and Exchange Commission unanimously, which is pretty unusual given the political divisions at the commission, unanimously proposed broad central clearing in the U.S. Treasury market, with few exemptions uh, for both the financing market called the repo market and for the cash securities trading market. Uh, the at the time there was a a flurry of public commentary, <clears throat> which was basically, uh, we like it for the repo market, uh, and we will continue as the industry has. Uh, market participants said we will continue to centrally clear the repo market, and the proposal will help, but we don't uh, generally like it for the cash securities trading market. The uh, objections for most being that it's an unnecessary cost uh, because of the cost of posting margin. And there are some ancillary costs like uh, clearing fees, uh, which one pays to the clearinghouse to uh, cover the operational costs and so on. Uh, of course, uh, one could say the same thing about any uh, market that is already centrally cleared. Why would anyone want to post margin uh, or pay the fees for central clearing? So I didn't find that objection in the case of the U.S. Treasury market very compelling. And it goes back to this issue of public goods, or what sometimes is called the tragedy of the commons, who is going to clean up the park uh, that everyone benefits from. No one has an incentive on their own to take a broom and sweep up all the leaves and uh, detritus in the Central Park um, to benefit everyone else because you're bearing uh, private costs for a public good. And that's why the proposal was made in the first place is to make the market safer and more efficient. So I wasn't that put off by the uh, by the uh, suggestions. This would be very costly. In fact, the costs are probably quite small. This, this year, I noticed a change in the tone of the commentary. I was uh, spoke at a ISDA conference, ISDA SIFMA conference, which are two of the large industry groups that um, 
coordinate uh, rules and uh, public commentary in, in these in these all of the markets we've been discussing today. And the tone of the discussion on the panel sessions uh, last um, uh, last month in New York was more like, we're not sure this is a good idea, but it seems to be coming. So that is, there's a recognition that it, the SEC will probably make this proposal uh, real and maybe next year. Uh, and now I see a lot more scurrying around getting ready for it, which is good news. You asked about the doubles in the details, uh, Nicola. <clears throat> uh, the one, one of the issues is I already mentioned, which is who is going to put up the customer margin? Will it be the customer itself or will it be the dealer on behalf of the customer? And if it's the latter, well, it doesn't really protect the dealer from the customer's risk because the dealer is only obligated to post the net position of the customers to the central counterparty, not the gross position. So it's not necessarily going to be as safe and sound as, as uh, the a sort of the typical uh, central clearing might be. Another interesting detail is there's currently a practice in the U.S. Treasury market of uh, what is called done with trading, which means that if you were to trade with me, uh, I'm your dealer, you're a customer, uh, then I would require that you centrally clear the trade with me as a matter of our uh, bilateral business arrangement. And then you might say, well, I really don't like the idea that uh, Daryl is uh, basically requiring that I trade with him if I want to centrally clear. Uh, it's kind of, it doesn't really open up competition. If Teo wanted to also offer you trading services, he would have a hard time uh, because I do your central clearing. <clears throat> Many industry participants want to do done away trading, meaning, <clears throat> Nicola, you would have the freedom, whether you centrally clear with me, your dealer or your primary dealer or not, you would be able to trade with anyone. <clears throat> that would be more competitive. Uh, you also asked, uh, Nicola, what about the dealers? How do they view these proposals? <clears throat> Generally speaking, uh, they don't like the central clearing proposal for the cash securities market, uh, possibly partly because of the cost, but also because of something Teo and I mentioned, which is it is a gateway to all to all trade, meaning once you have central clearing in place across the entire market, a trade platform operator an exchange like BrokerTech or TradeWeb or Market Access could begin to offer customers the opportunity to trade directly with each other, disintermediating dealers on some trades. And dealers, of course, do not want to be disintermediated. Uh, that's a natural. That's a natural objection. And so they're not that much in favor of uh, central clearing in the cash securities market. Uh, but I. But I think, as I mentioned, they're coming around to the view that it's going to happen. And they're getting ready for exactly how to implement it. So, Theo, you're um, leading a, a global association of CCPs. Can you give us a comparative perspective here? How does the U.S. Uh, Treasury securities market, both cash uh, trading and repo uh, secured um, uh, funding, uh, how does that compare internationally? Are, are, are some of those markets for government security centrally cleared already in other jurisdictions. Can you give us a picture? Yes, absolutely. And, and on that point, now I also feel I need to make a disclaimer. I mean, obviously, FICC and DTCC are members of CCP Global. I, you, one of um, one of their uh, CROs is uh, my treasurer. Um, so I should mention that any CCP we talk about is probably a member um, as a disclaimer. Uh, it is common around the world that for the, um, let me say, emerging market or, or less developed government bond markets, you typically don't even have a centralized exchange CCP combination. So the question doesn't really arise. It has come up much more in the last five years or so where different uh, smaller countries are really thinking of using central counterparties to help structure their government bond uh, both cash and repo markets. They would like to develop them or they would like to um, make them more appealing to foreign banks to participate in them and arranging it through a central counterparty would be attractive. For the developed ones, the bulk of trading tends to be 
bilateral. However, <clears throat> there are some notable exceptions, specifically in Europe, in Paris, Frankfurt, uh, Milan, uh, and of course, London, you have for uh, years had very active, centrally cleared, both cash and repo markets, uh, including with interesting features wherein uh, participants can maintain a longstanding net position. Uh, there are advantages, I think, to the US proposals that are currently uh, under underway to increase the uh, availability of offsets between derivative CCPs, for instance, the CME's offering of futures on government bonds and the uh, trades that would happen on the cash leg at uh, DTCC's FICC. But uh, by and large, as a comparison, it is generally the rule that these markets are historically bilateral. Um, historically, they had a very large central bank involvement in them. Uh, there have been very successful CCPs that offered themselves without mandates, but by and large, to Daryl's point before, there is a collective action problem typically in uh, making sure that the bulk of it is cleared. Uh, naturally, the oh sorry. Go, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that naturally the world is looking uh, at uh, at the SEC and the Fed uh, with great interest because I think that it is uh, not only, of course, the the most important of these markets, but it is also um, something where the structural decisions undertaken there might inspire others. So it's a typical question from the other CCPs of what's going on in the in the U.S. So you mentioned uh, Germany, the so U.K., <laughs> France, and Italy um, as having already uh, some of their uh, government securities markets, uh, cash and repo, uh, being centrally cleared. But there are the outliers. There are, there are basically only those four. Uh, no, th there are plenty of others. Um, I mentioned those only because of the scale of the market. So, so just to be clear, the, the, the bulk of those markets of European government bond markets are bilaterally managed. Uh, but the centrally cleared markets are very large um, in absolute terms and in relative terms compared to other CCPs. So, for instance, uh, the Swedish CCP in Stockholm also offers these services. So there are plenty of others, um, but those are the ones that I would uh, say come uh, anywhere close to the type of numbers that, uh, that Daryl had on his other slide. slide. Um, the, in terms of derivatives, uh, can you give us a sense of, uh, if I remember correctly, there are five derivative asset classes, uh, interest rates, um, foreign exchange, uh, commodities, credit, and equity. Uh, are all of these uh, affected by the decisions that were made in Pittsburgh um, 12 years ago or so? Uh, to have a central clearing mandate, or is it only some of them? Uh, what's the kind of lay of the land here? So the, the historically, the, the bulk of forward commodities markets was typically uh, centrally cleared or managed through uh, clearing houses. So for instance, uh, I was in Chicago last week, and that's one of the, the origin stories uh, where um, enormous commodity markets in, in North America would uh, be arranged for their forward delivery in Chicago. Also other cities too, like Minneapolis. Um, so those have traditionally been on uh, central counterparties. That's also been the case in Europe, in Le Havre, in Paris famously, uh, with this historical uh, coffee CCP. For the, the reforms that took place, um, it is, I would say, in terms of bandwidth of conversation, probably been about 80 to 90% of it. In terms of real risk, it's something no larger than 30% of what's currently uh, managed in margin terms by central counterparties around the world. The bulk of it continues- Across, across a, you mean derivatives versus cash markets, right? Oh, uh, sorry, no, so, I mean, oh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, sorry. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't precise. Uh, out of derivatives markets, and, and the reforms are really only targeting the, the derivative markets, out of derivative markets, about 30% of what CCP is clear today is in OTC derivatives. So those that were the target of the G20 and other reforms. The remaining part is uh, exchange traded derivatives across all of the categories that you mentioned. Although I would say that CDS and credit derivatives on exchange are really uh, an aberration. They, they have not been particularly successful in the past. So for the portion of OTC derivatives, which were previously not cleared and now are, um, there's quite some debate. Um, there's paucity of data in the bilateral space. Uh, it's very easy on the CCP space to say how large they are. The BIS does a valiant effort of trying to estimate this number. Uh, depending on who you ask, you either end up Thanks at- Thanks for international settlements in Basel. Oh, 
excuse me, sorry. Yes. So they sorry. collect data from central banks uh, who collect them from market participants. Uh, estimates of how much is cleared, depending on what type of metric you're interested in, range from 50% to 90%. Uh, so this is one challenge that you sort of need to compare to the other half, which is not as um, well disclosed. Just to, just to understand this is within the OTC derivative space, how much is uh, centrally cleared, right, um, Daryl? Uh, I'm not sure I have the right statistic on that question, but I wanted to uh, come back to the question of what remains to be centrally cleared in the derivative space. Uh, the foreign exchange forward market uh, which is a uh, not centrally traded has a very large amount of risk, bilateral risk uh, that is not centrally cleared. I'll back up to the Pittsburgh Protocol. It was left open uh, in the United States at the time of the Dodd Frank Act whether the forward foreign exchange market, which is about two to three trillion dollar a day market of uh, uh, trading activity, whether that would be centrally cleared or not by rule. The United States Treasury market uh, was designated in the Dodd-Frank Act to make a decision within a year, I believe it was a year, or maybe it was two years after Dodd-Frank, about whether to centrally clear that market. And uh, you know, I, I made a submission into their uh, comment process because in my view, that is an enormous amount of risk that's not centrally cleared. And uh, it's quite a systemic kind of risk. Uh, the Treasury Department came back with the decision that the risk in that market is not sufficiently large uh, to warrant central clearing. Uh, but my calculations show that it's actually very large. There's a significant amount of uh, forward foreign when, exchange. When you say the market, sorry, just for clarification, Daryl, that the forward uh, market in foreign exchange, right? Yes, yeah, so this would be, for example, you and I, Nicola, would agree to exchange dollars for euros in uh, four weeks at a particular uh, exchange rate. You could, you could manage the settlement risk on that at CLS if you chose to. It's not required. However, the settlement risk will not cover me if you decide not to to uh, settle the trade, then I won't be required to send you the dollars, but I will lose money if the dollar euro exchange rate has, has changed between the time at which we agreed to exchange and the ultimate settlement date. And that uh, the amount of risk there is really, it's ginormous. Uh, it's a spectacular amount of risk. CLS does not cover that mark to market risk and nobody else does. So while uh, Teo is right that some countries might not want to participate in cross-border uh, FX uh, trade uh, central clearing, like you know countries that have capital controls, even uh, dollar euro, which is a very large fraction of the market. It's about twenty-five percent of the market, which is there's no particular reason not to centrally clear that, other than the cost, which we come back to earlier. So that's an example of a very large OTC derivatives market. Uh, that's not centrally cleared, that could be, um, if were it not for the um, the cost, basically. Uh, it would also, again, open up the possibility of more, uh, more platform-based, uh, all-to-all, or many-to-many, -many, at least, trading opportunities. And um, generally speaking, the largest banks are not uh, going to favor uh, that. Naturally, I wouldn't, if I was Jamie Dimon or the head of one of the largest banks, I would say, well, why would we want to open up this market uh, to greater competition? It's working pretty we, well we, already. We we have questions from the audience, and I'll come to them. But before that, I I want to ask you a follow up question on what you just said about cost and you know the resistance from entrenched players in the industry, which benefit from the current market structure. But going back to the political or policy issues that Taylor was mentioning, is there also a question of jurisdiction and platform? I mean, we see that. Uh, in the EU right now is there a dec decision about equivalence with the UK, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, remaining issues uh, from Brexit, if not the biggest one uh, that has not yet come uh, to a steady state in terms of financial markets. Um, is there, what about fragmentation, right? This was a big debate uh, 10, 15 years ago when the Pittsburgh reforms were being discussed, the Pittsburgh summit uh, was in 2010. Um, is it 
uh, possible to have a single platform for clearing that everybody is happy to use, even if it's extraterritorial for the jurisdictions that are not its uh, home base, uh, or is that intractable? How is that uh, to be handled? <clears throat> well, I'll give you my shot at that, and then Teo might. Uh, so the big uh, elephant in this room is Brexit. Uh, before Brexit, there was a kind of grudging view in the uh, non-UK part of the European Union that uh, we could allow central clearing in London because of the benefits of doing it in one place are so enormous due to this netting benefit that I discussed earlier. If you have trades uh, uh, in, that are uh, netted across the European Union in one place, it really reduces the, uh, the amount of risk and the cost of central clearing. And But after Brexit, um, the new European Union felt that it was uh, first not necessarily safe uh, for them, at least that was the view that was expressed, to allow all the derivatives like the interest rate swaps uh, that were cleared in London to, to allow that to remain because the central bank could not provide liquidity as easily. The rules uh, that the United Kingdom might apply would not necessarily be under the jurisdiction of uh, the European Union. Many, many reasons and also the commercial advantage of having that clearing business done in, uh, in let's say, Paris or another uh, European center. Or just in Frankfurt, uh, where Till used to work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so all of those uh, changed the calculus, and most of much of that central clearing is now moving into the continent. Although, because of the loss of netting, there is, there is uh, still some... Uh, discussion and tail might be able to bring you more up to date. But that is a the issue that you raise, Nikolai, is a really big and really interesting issue is fragmentation on the one hand is quite costly, it's less efficient, uh, versus the political and also um, uh, financial stability concerns of the official sector in the in the European Union, uh, pushing towards having central clearing done in the European Union and not extra territorially in London. I'd maybe just highlight another dimension in, in addition to, to the policy one. And if I can to the policy one, maybe one thing that of course is very important in these and that interplays a bit with my previous remarks on, on FX markets and CLS is the um, restrictions, willingness or uh, unavailability of central banks to ensure central bank currency settlement for centrally cleared markets if they're extraterritorial. Some of them are, uh, comfortable with it, others are not. And I think that that's sort of a, an undercurrent to, to many of, of these concerns. The, the other thing I would mention is I agree with Daryl, I mean, clearing a particular market in full in one CCP is by far the most efficient. Um, but there have been longstanding cases where you sort of have what, would, what many might consider an unnatural uh, split. So just as an example, uh, the euro denominated short term interest rate market uh, was cleared for decades, uh, very successfully in London and the long ended Frankfurt. Um, and there were, of course, attempts by both CCPs to, to wrest uh, control of the, of the other end of the curve uh, in the futures market, but uh, this did not work. Whereas in contrast in the US, this is very elegantly uh, arranged in one uh, system. So. It, it's not only, I think, the, the politics, it's also the creativity, but also decisions of market participants for where they decide to pull their liquidity. Um, the two, of course, intersects, and we saw this great flurry of papers left, right, and center following Brexit, um, given that the magnitude of, of those markets. But uh, it's not always the case that the, the market goes for what is the most uh, purely efficient or risk system. Uh, there might be other considerations for why different components of different markets reside in uh, different CCPs or even different jurisdictions. And I, and I would say that this part of the challenge is the definition of a market. I saw a question in the chat which asked for markets and depending on who you ask, some of those are part of another one um, or they are a distinct sort of uh, trading area uh, in, in their own right. I hope that's a good non-answer um, to, to your question. That's a non-answer. Don't you want to go a bit uh, further into the fragmentation issue? I, I would go into it uh, with respect to the interest rate swap market, uh, which is the big the big one. 
It's by far the biggest market for central clearing. London Clearing House uh, in London is the largest central counterparty. And the United States uh, US dollar interest rate swap market is by and large centrally cleared in London. Only a little bit is cleared in the United States. Uh, and, and despite uh, it being outside the, the United States uh, for regulatory reasons, uh, it's nevertheless, the efficiency gains are so large that American uh, market participants prefer uh, to, uh, to centrally clear in, in London. Uh, and I, so that's an example of how it can work. Uh, but in the European Union, there is a number of other calculations involved. So the Europeans, uh, let's spend one more minute on that because it's uh, so important in the European discussion and UK. So Europeans say, well, but it's not that symmetrical because the big dealers tend to be American. So the, uh, they are under American jurisdiction. Uh, and, uh, and that's true both uh, from an American perspective and from a European perspective. So actually, the American authorities have much more control over the market uh, than the European authorities have uh, in terms of the extraterritorial role of London. What do we make of that argument? I think there's something to that. Uh, there's another dimension, which is if the CCP has a liquidity crisis where it's solvent, but it's unable to get enough cash to settle the trades because perhaps some um, clearing members have failed, the, the central bank is the natural uh, source of liquidity in a case like that. And in the United Kingdom, the central bank has explicitly stated that it will supply liquidity under these circumstances. However, uh, the EU authorities uh, might be concerned that a foreign central bank providing liquidity to their market participants is not as satisfactory as the European central bank providing liquidity to European market participants in euros when necessary, and has felt quite uncomfortable. I mean, ECB officials have stated publicly that they have felt uncomfortable about um, uh, having the Bank of England being the source of liquidity for a large amount of euro-denominated interest rate swaps, and I and I find I find that quite understandable. And in at fact, in fact, at one point before Brexit, when they were all part of the European Union, there was actually a lawsuit that was initiated uh, in Europe uh, to force central clearing uh, in, in, Euro, in Euro-denominated instruments back into the EU, uh, that is in the non-UK part of the EU. Okay, we have a question from uh, Jeff um, Hastrock um, on the, going back to um, to the, the question, the title question of this session. Um, what other markets beyond uh, cash and repo uh, US treasury markets are ripe for additional clearing mandates? Why US agencies, corporate bonds, uh, interest rate swaptions, equity swaps? Um, so we're going into a lot of market jargon here, but all these are important segments. Uh, Daryl, what's your favorite list? Well, the top of my list is the one I mentioned, which is the forward foreign exchange market, a multi-trillion dollar per day of transactions, which is not centrally cleared, and which presents uh, the possibility of significant systemic risk in a currency crisis, where counterparties would be unable to cover the change in market price. Uh, the, next, uh, the next one on my list might be the corporate bond market, in the following sense, it's not really, an, uh, as Teo described, it's a kind of many, many different uh, individual types of corporate bonds. It's not obvious, uh, it's not as homogeneous, uh, it's not obvious a candidate for central clearing as, say, treasuries, swaps, FX, or equities. But on the other hand, there is a, a tendency in this market towards trade platforms, which allow all to all trade and act as a de facto central counterparty for the market without being necessarily regulated as such. Uh, so if there's a market platform, that, yeah, pardon me, uh, Nic Nicola? For example, of those platforms? Well, an example would be market access, which uh, whose, whose uh, business plan I admire because they're bringing much more efficiency into the corporate bond market, but they allow um, many market participants to trade uh, anonymously on 
their platform. And because of that, market access is responsible for trade settlement, which means in principle, it's acting as a central counterparty, but in fact, it doesn't necessarily have the margin default guarantee fund and uh, regulatory oversight of a central counterparty. That would be an example of if it gets bigger, it's not that big yet, but if it gets much bigger, where it would be natural for that to go into central clearing. Uh, we have a question from uh, Wen Chan Tuang, um, and another question which is related, which is all about the liquidity that would be absorbed uh, in uh, in the CCPs uh, in case of a uh, broader central clearing mandate. So, so. Uh, Huang's question is about what would happen with that liquidity. Uh, um, will the CCP park the cash with the Fed? Does that suck out liquidity from the financial system? Um, and the other uh, question from uh, an anonymous participant is, would that drive participants outside uh, of the market? Uh, and uh, and what would be the, the implications of that? So uh, maybe Darrell first and Theo next. Okay, so on the, on the question of liquidity, the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation has a, a rather unusual uh, setup for liquidity. They have what's called a capped contingent liquidity facility by which they have a call on liquidity from each of the clearing members, which tend to be large banks. And this, uh, the size of this call on liquidity from the large banks uh, ranges between, let's say, 80 to 100 billion, 100 billion US dollars. The idea being that Nicola, if you failed on your position and they had to liquidate your commitment to settle, they might need some cash and they could call on Teo and me, two other clearing members and say, uh, you're each up for 5 billion. Uh, we need your cash today, please send it over so that we can uh, settle these, these trades that Nicola failed on. Uh, if the market were to become broadly centrally cleared, the CCLF that I mentioned would have to be expanded Recent calculations by FICC show that it wouldn't have to expand as much as people had feared because of all these netting benefits. Uh, so I'm, I'm not as worried about liquidity for this market. And in, implicitly, the liquidity of the Federal Reserve System is behind this. Now, the Fed has never stated explicitly that it would provide liquidity to the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation or to any uh, central counterparty. However, it has given accounts where that liquidity in principle could be provided at the Fed, uh, has given accounts to these CCPs. And I think nobody, no serious uh, market participant doubts that if it were merely a question of not having enough cash, that the Fed would actually step in and provide liquidity for US Treasury securities uh, to the FICC. I certainly feel that they would very likely do that. The Bank of England does that in the case of the UK. So I don't think liquidity is the main problem. Um, I think uh, that liquidity is is uh, is manageable even, and it gets more manageable in fact, as the market gets more centrally cleared uh, because uh, you actually have access uh, to these uh, uh, well-managed and well-regulated capped contingent liquidity facility. And in principle, you might have access to the Federal Reserve System, whereas if the market remains bilateral, then how do you get liquidity into a many-to-many -many bilateral market where a network of very complicated network of bilateral trades needs liquidity in a crisis? Uh, that that can be very tenuous, as we saw when Lehman collapsed. Uh, yes, no, thank you. And if I may, just to Jeff Jeffrey's question very quickly, and to, to um if I may elaborate a little bit on what uh, Daryl mentioned, for corporate bonds, um, because you have so many different instruments even issued by a single corporate name, uh, you get quite a wide spectrum. So if you centrally clear the market, you will get all those benefits, but the, the netting by trade will be lower because you're not netting across you know, all of General Motors as different uh, debt instruments. One interesting feature of the European repo market is that a popular type of trade is for a basket. So you take a basket of government bonds that can mix issuance from different sovereigns, 
Um, and of course, there are different haircuts to the bonds that make up the totality depending on the characteristics. Um, but that's something that might arise. We're starting to see that in the future space, there's increasing trading in corporate bond indices. So it might be that you get a sort of basket corporate view, which could be more suitable for clearing than the individual trades in themselves because a short settlement cycle combined with lower netting because people are interested in that particular ISIN or QSIP uh, would reduce the advantages of clearing. Uh, I'll mention interest rate swaps because this has not been included in the mandates, um, but typically the origin of most CCPs that work in rates markets has been to do the futures and the options on, for instance, government debt. So it's kind of interesting that we have a move of the uh, delta, that's the sort of direct swaps, the linear products or nearly linear products onto CCPs, but not the options, which typically sort of are part of uh, a single trade. Uh, people use the interest rate swaps themselves to hedge out the delta risk of the swaps in many cases. So it would be a natural candidate in my view, just from a holistic view of the market. Uh, Wen Xiang's question, uh, I think Daryl answered it perfectly. It, it, in my view, it's either a very simple question or a very complex one. So the, the simple side of it is, and just for the benefit of the audience that might not uh, uh, have spent time reading CCP rule books, when you give money to the CCP as margin, you can give securities or cash. If you only give cash, the CCP may invest that into reverse repos because that's the safest way to do it. It can often, uh, for systemically important CCPs and other special ones, place it with the central bank. If you place it with a central bank, of course, this is uh, not lucrative because the interest on the collateral, including coupons for any securities that you give, go back to the participants of the CCP. The CCP doesn't keep this income stream, right? This is only held by the CCP until the trades are settled. So if you've closed out all your trades, you get back all of your collateral. Uh, so in that sense, uh, a CCP managing its liquidity is something that they take care of all the time. And if you have too much security, too little cash, you can ask your members to substitute. Um, if you have cash, but you don't want to place it because you're concerned about credit risk or uh, poor pricing, you can always uh, hold on to the cash, of course, at the detriment of uh, um, income stream for your members, um, which is sensible in difficult times. And there's a separate part of that, which I'm, I'm mindful of time, but it is a, a very interesting question of what happens because this market will not move in isolation from actions by the central bank, right? If there is big movements in the market, the central bank themselves will be undertaking typically one would expect open market operations or others. So uh, Wen Xiang, uh, let's talk after. Uh, I, I'd love to, to discuss that for our, sorry, Nikolai, I can't resist. That's great. Indeed, we're out of time, and um, I uh, would want to continue for another hour, but we cannot do that today. Thank you so much uh, to Darren Duffy and Theo Floor for an illuminating uh, conversation on things that generally are very obscure. So you really brought light on the darkness. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to uh, cover that space, of course, because it's so important uh, for um, the financial system in general. But the next uh, um, session uh, of this series will be on something different. On uh, October 25, we'll discuss uh, the European Bank Resolution Framework with uh, Dominique Labourex, who has um, taken over the single resolution board of the um, Eurozone and Banking Union earlier this year, and Katie Judge, um, the, the legal specialist, to bring a transatlantic perspective. Uh, again, many, many thanks to our two speakers, to the audience for their engagement, and uh, see you soon again. Nicola, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for the great questions. Terrific. Uh, thank you. Very perceptive questions, Nicola. Really enjoyed it. Nice to see you again, Theo. Same, Daryl. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you again. Real pleasure to be here.